Okay, you can. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. On behalf of Nepal Institute of International Cooperation and Engagement, it gives me great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished chair, fellow scholars, and participants who have joined us through Zoom and watching live on our YouTube channel. We are thrilled to have you as on board with us today at the National Youth Scholars Summit 2020. This international forum brings together rigorous erudite young scholars from all around the world over a single platform. The aim is to create an academia space to encourage young scholars, academicians from fields of international relations, political science, diplomacy, public policy, administration, and related subfields. The conference will be held for three days consecutively through 30 sessions, with two parallel sessions running in the white and the green rooms. The conference will feature 275 young scholars from 25 different countries who will be delivering their presentation and sharing their understanding with us. The session is streaming live on our YouTube channel, so please free, feel free to share it on our social media handle as hashtag IYSS2020. This is the 23rd session of the conference and to share and moderate this session, we are honored to have Professor Arvind Kumar here with us today. Welcome on board with us. Sir. Shruti, Shruti. Professor, yes Shruti. sir. Uh, it's not Arvind Kumar, it's Neha Bansal. All right, sorry, so I wasn't Neha informed of this feed. A second. Just a minute, sir. If you don't have a bio, let me know. I'll send you immediately. Hello. Yes. Sir, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, welcome on coming on board with us, Neha ma'am. Could you please shed some light on how the conference, how, what are you expecting out of the conference and how the, you know, you want the scholars to present their paper and you Shruti, know, Shruti, shed some light on bio? First we should introduce her. Do we have her bio? No, sir, Sumina so did not inform me about this. Okay, just a second, two minutes. I'm sending you on your WhatsApp and Facebook. Uh, you, you can start from very I'm so sorry for the technical. No, no, it's okay. We'll start from the very beginning because we can edit that part. So I'm putting it on, on your WhatsApp in nice intern group as well as on your Facebook. Or shall I put it in the chat box for you to read? Shruti? Shruti, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I'll do it. Okay, so I'm putting in the chat box as well. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Just a second. All right. It's, I don't know why I'm not able to paste. There's some problem with... Uh, Internet. Shruti. Shruti, I'm putting on Facebook because I can't send it there. Yes, sir. Yes. Did you get it on uh, WhatsApp? Uh, because I also send it to WhatsApp. Did you receive on WhatsApp? Yes, sir. I have just received it. Okay, now I start from very beginning. Yes, sir. All right. Good, so sorry. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. On behalf of Nepal Institute of International Cooperation and Engagement, it gives me great pleasure to extend my warm welcome to our distinguished chair, fellow scholars, and participants who have joined us through Zoom and watching us live on YouTube. We are thrilled to have you join us today at International. Youth Scholars Summit 2020. This international forum aims to bring together rigorous and erudite young, erudite young scholars from all around the world who have taken the who have given us the great pleasure to come over a single platform and aim to create an academia space to encourage young scholars and academicians from the field of international relations, political science, diplomacy, sub policy, 
administration and related subfields. The conference will be held for three days consecutively to 30 different sessions. Two parallel sessions running in the wise and the green room. The conference will feature 275 scholars from 25 different countries who will be delivering their presentation and sharing their understanding today with us. The session is streaming live on our YouTube, so please feel free to share it on your social media handle as hashtag IISS2020. This is the 27th session of the con 23rd session of the conference, and to chair and moderate this con session, we are honored to have Neha Bansal with us. Welcome on board, ma'am. Neha is currently appointed as India country head for global funds to end modern slavery, an international body constituted under the government of UK, USA, and Norway. She is also a fellow for One Asia under the prestigious Asia Fellowship at Harvard University. SH Center for De Democratic Governance and Innovation, aiming to develop Harvard's first Asia program, looking at the identity of region beyond the China-US conflict. Neha is also a classical Indian dancer. She has, per she has profound knowledge about Qatar and she's also interested in writing. Being an economic and social policy expert for Asia, Neha has served the United Nations for close to 10 years now in her previous roles in UNODC and UNDP. In this role, Neha has worked on development and development diplomacy programs across South and Southeast Asia region to address issues of poverty and vulnerability of women and children. Transnational organized crime and recruitment of women and children in drug trafficking trade. Nia has also spent time with PFIDA civil service and advisor designing a multi country program against modern slavery on social protection policy prevention. Her articles on development and international policies politics are regularly covered by different political and development journals. Neha completed her master's in public policy administration from Harvard University. In her free time, Neha is a trained Indian classical dancer having given performances in USA and across India. She is also a writer and has written several plays that were covered across leading newspapers and TV. We are so honored to have you on board with us. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Morning um, and a warm welcome to the 23rd session, Understanding South Asia at the International Young Scholars Summit by NICE. It's a personal honor for me to always be involved with NICE, uh, the initiative that NICE organizes. And it's a pleasure to invite each of the speakers today for the morning and all those joining us on Zoom from the region and around the world. Understanding Asia, well, I'll use a borrowed term, which is um, understanding really the dynamics between guns and bread. So on one hand, there are several who believe that South Asia has fallen off the map or is only on the map because of the conflicts, whether it is India, Pakistan, Kashmir, the Rohingyas, uh, and more recently, Nepal, so the guns. And then there are several who also believe that there's immense potential for cooperation around trade, economics, natural disasters, which is something that affects uh, a lot of South Asia, so the bread. But the recent COVID has, has uh, only accentuated both the guns, the conflict, as well as the bread, the need for cooperation. And therefore, I would be very keen to hear from our esteemed speakers today how the breaking away of the old traditional bilateral ties around guns and bread is giving way to a new Asia, South Asia. And how does this new South Asia play in another very important trend that is taking over Asia, which is the idea of Asia, a common idea of Asia, which we see in the Asianization of Western cities, uh, which we see in Asia's presence in multilateral institutions, which we see in bilateral ties. So without much delay, uh, we have eight speakers today, and each speaker has eight minutes for your presentation. Um, I will interrupt you 
after uh, when you have two minutes left to give you a heads up. And um, all those who are on Zoom and uh, want to ask a question, please place your questions in the chat box. And of course, as moderator, I have the special privilege to pick the questions that are most relevant to the discussion and, and take forward the idea. So place your questions in the chat box. And with that, it gives me great pleasure to invite our first speaker for the morning, Pratik Raj Joshi a student from the Tribhuvan University, Nepal, and he's going to be speaking to us on a very important topic, the requirement for bilateral talks in SAC. And please, if I could request the rest of you to keep yourselves on mute and welcome Pratik. The floor is yours. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, am I audible, loud and clear? Yes, yes. So thank you everyone for being here and thank you ma'am for that introduction. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to start my presentation. So I'll share my slides. Uh, are the slides visible? Yeah, they're visible. Okay. So uh, thank you everyone for being here and thank you everyone for uh, listening to this presentation and being present in this event. Um, thank you, ma'am, for your uh, introduction. And uh, uh, I'm Pratik Joshi, a student, a master's student of Department of International Relations and Diplomacy at Tivan University, Nepal. And I'll be presenting on the topic, the requirement of bilateral talks in SARC. So let's start the presentation. The South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, uh, which was established in 1985, results from the joint effort of heads of state that share numerous commonalities. It is an association of countries with shared cultures, language, and ethnicity. The association was established with a common objective of regional peace, economic prosperity, and social empowerment for the people. However, in the contemporary scenario, the rise of political tensions, bilateral issues, socioeconomic problems, and other power interests in the region has made the regional cooperation a bit difficult at best. The regional organization has neither been able to unite for any common cause or nor has it shown any signs of movement towards a reju rejuvenating stage because of the absence of regular summits and conferences. Uh, whether it be the aggravating India-Pakistan relations or the recent shake on India-Nepal relations, lack of diplomatic and bilateral talks regarding uh, the underlying conflicts and the constant failure in reaching to a conclusion should be considered as one of the prime factors which makes SARC feeble. And now exacerbating this condition is SARC's provision of bearing discussions and contentious bilateral issues. Uh, if we see the SARC charter, the article 10.2 uh, mentions bilateral and contentious issues shall be excluded from deliberations. Now the ratification of this provision has made SARC unable to make any substantive progress in, on some of the prime issues of contention, which has, been, uh, which, has, which has not been able to carry SARC forward. The bilateral disputes have been the reason for the cancellation of numerous, numerous summits and meetups. Also, in the absence of proper provision, states opt to the assistance of external powers, which can make the South Asia a proxy region. Now, let's before going on to why the provision of uh, the provision of excluding bilateral relation was not a proper relation was not a proper decision. Let's just go to the rationale behind the provision of this provision. One of the most popular explanations of the reason behind the exclusion of bilateral contentious issues is its positive impact on instilling sovereign equality. Bilateral and contentious issues are explicitly excluded from the deliberations and cooperation is based on sovereign equality, territorial integrity, political independence and non-interference in each other internal affairs. It also gives the small states a substantial acknowledgement in the platform. Also, there's a second reason which uh, directs us towards India's skepticism. Being a geographically centralized country surrounded by other member states, India was skeptical of the actual rationale of the establishment of SARC. Surrounded by SARC members from all the sides, India became assured that the inclusion of the principle of Article X would, Article 10 would hinder any members from using SARC against India. Furthermore, there was also heightening issues between, of India with China and Pakistan as well. So, India somehow perceived the formation of SARC as joint effort of China and Pakistan to surround India for self-interest. Furthermore, the lack of trust and the lack of any kind of cooperation between the South Asian regions was also one of the main reasons why this article was included and was unanimously ratified. 
Now let's talk about why excluding the bilateral talks was a wrong step. Now the principle of exclusion of contentious bilateral issues was previously aimed at protecting the sovereign equality and territorial integrity of states. However, in the present context, it has been backfiring. If we now look at the chart in the presentation, we see two points, the start one and start two. Now let's discuss from start two first. The long-standing conflict between India and Pakistan dates back to 1947 after the independence and partition of both nations. Since then, the relation have been deteriorating, which has become a bottleneck in achieving effective coordination. Also, the SARC summit preceding the 18th summit held in Nepal got cancelled because of the Indo-Pak tensions. Now, far from playing a role of interstate conflict, the, region, the regional organization has strayed away, very far away from the crisis of these two countries. There are multiple political, economic, and security problems between these two states, the most contentious of which is the Jammu Kashmir land dispute. Since the inception of this dispute, the resolution of Kashmir conflict established a ceasefire, however, not a significant one. It could not entirely end the dispute. This proves that the decision to take the Kashmir issue to the United Nations was not fruitful, mainly because the parties of the United Nations that were involved in resolving the dispute had no knowledge and concern over the region's peace. In case the resolutions had been taken to SARC panel, a more wise and prudent approach might have been proposed since the decision would have impacted every SARC members. The rising tensions between India and Pakistan has severely impacted the peace and stability of the whole South Asian region. Hence, there would be no other parties who could have effectively and genuinely worked on resolving this, this, this dispute. Now let's again go to the start one point. In the early 2010, the relations between India and Sri Lanka deteriorated because a DMK, a political party of Tamil Nadu, was believed to, which was believed to be close to Sri Lanka, went, went against the United Progressive Alliance, which was a supporter of the National Congress of India. This deteriorated the relationship between India and Sri Lanka. Now, as a consequence of this deterioration and lack of bilateral talks, China gained a strategic advantage over Sri Lanka by moving to the space that was vacated by India by rejecting its involvement in building the Hambantota port. Sri Lanka first approached India to assist in building this port. However, India's foreign policy got driven by its deteriorating suspicion over Sri Lanka and hence it refused to provide any assistance or get involved in the port. However, after the inception of India in the port, after the inception of China in the port, the region and its stability got further deteriorated. The Western powers, along with India, even termed it as a debt trap. Now let's talk about the India-Nepal relations. This, this, the current agitation in the relation between India and Nepal has exacerbated this condition because Nepal was considered to be the last hope for SARC resignation. The historical second amendment of the constitution of Nepal updated its political map by including the territories like Kalapani, Lipulek, and Limpiadura that India also claimed. Now, let's not discuss about who was correct or who was wrong, but let's discuss why this did not go to the bilateral talks because SARC, didn't have, SARC did not have any provisions. India also closed all rooms for bilateral discussions at this time. Hence, Nepal had nothing to do but just to inch towards China for, for any kind of, for every kind of economic assistance. India for its part, as the largest economic contributor and the most powerful member, has the responsibility to effectively practice its neighborhood first policy and resolve every dispute surrounding it through bilateral measures. From Nepal's perspective, the deepening tensions that emerged after the unofficial blockade, aggravated by India's encroachment of its territory, <clears throat> leaves it with nothing but to seek the support of the only other nation that it shares its, bo its borders with. Now, any of the country could have been wrong in this situation. However, the thing that needs to be put more attention towards is the inception of China in this issue. India has been allegedly claiming, uh, blaming Nepal of being inching towards China, while, while the, uh, the relations between these two historically important nations have been deteriorating under this ground. Hence, SARC needs to mandate the decision regarding the talks and bilateral issues that would bolster the unity in the region by thwarting the effort of any external powers to exercise ploy by stepping on the bilateral disagreements. To conclude my presentation, there is hardly any South Asian state that does not agree on the importance of rejuvenating SARC. In the present liberalized and institutionalized world, where the role of international and regional institutions are burgeoning at a rapid pace, South Asia also requires to be an active and powerful regional entity. However, for the reinvigoration of Shark, the 
old and obsolete character charter needs to be amended, especially the principle that excludes the provision of talks and contentious issues. South Asia houses a significant portion of the world population and hence it has always been in the interest of every powerful nation. On the quest to establish strong influence, parties and external powers may strategically use the rising bilateral tensions towards fulfilling their own self-interest. Hence, to eliminate this and establish South Asia as an independent and self-decisive bloc, SARC needs to rethink its policy of exclusion on talks of bilateral issues without hampering the independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of any of the member states. states. Because of the provisions absence, the states opt for internationalizing the disputes, which make the entrance of third parties way easier. These external entities have almost nothing to do with regional peace and stability, and they spare no pains to turn, this to turn their involvement into their advantage. SARC's priorities need to change and it should play a mediator's role which is not only possible only if which is only possible if it allows talks and bilateral issues. This would put the association back on the rail by restoring the feeling of trust, cordial relations and regional integration on its member states. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you Pritu. Um, I didn't have to interrupt you because you kept to the time. Thank you so much for that. Um, are there any questions? And if you could just place them in the chat box, please. In the meantime, as as uh, viewers from Zoom are typing in their question, and I hope they will, uh, I have a question for you. I think sure, this is a very, very uh, important aspect of SARC, which is the fact that uh, contentious issues are not, uh, you know, there is a shy we shy away from discussing contentious issues at SAC because of the stalls. The question I want to ask you is that is this the time for bilateral talks or action? We've been talking and uh, usually, you know, talks are always the first uh, diplomatic um, uh, tool that one uses. But often talks are misplaced and is a time when India is already feeling this uh, being encircled is there other things that India and other countries have to do before they get onto the table? Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for that question. And I absolutely agree to your point that action speaks louder than, louder than words. Uh, but uh, I would say that because of the absence of any kind of bilateral uh, platforms, we have not been able to initiate any plans, um, let alone implementation of those plans. I will give you an example of what happened with the relations with India and Nepal. Uh, without any bilateral talks, Nepal uh, opted to ratify a new map, including some of the disputed territories. And that, that was a part of the action, but that further deteriorated the relationship between these two nations. Both uh, India did not uh, uh, formally ratify Nepal's map, which, uh, you know, uh, this uh, exacerbated the relations. So I think you are right, action would, should be taken place in any kind of issues, but there should be a proper, proper platform for talks for coming into common grounds so that there would be a win-win situation for all the nations. And then after the unanimous ratification of those two parties involved, or more than two parties involved, then we can move forward to uh, taking actions. But uh, saying this, it does not mean that uh, talks are just the important aspects. Actions are more important, but only after a possible bilateral talks, the actions could be uh, implemented. Thank you. Are there any questions from the um, from those watching? I also uh, want to extend the invitation to ask questions to the other panelists as you will be speaking in a little while. So any question that pertains to your topic that uh, that um, Pratik has been. Okay, I think uh, Pratik, you're lucky. You've gotten off the hook more easily. No questions for you. Okay. So we'll move on to our... Um, sorry, uh, just to interrupt, can I, can I pose a question? Sure. Um, so, uh, Pratik, when you uh, say that uh, there are chances uh, of the SARC countries, uh, you know, being rejuvenated um, with, with uh, overcoming contentious issues and the uh, amending SARC charter, uh, there are few theories of international relations and uh, nationalism that exclusively claim uh, that countries need to keep hostilities alive. Um, countries keep to, you know, have to build nationalism alive to uh, survive and also to differentiate themselves from the others. So in case of India, Pakistan, uh, we have been seeing it and most of them contain that Kashmir issue has been 
a core issue that has to be alive to make sure India and Pakistan survive how they are surviving today. In that case, do you think um, SARC charter can be rejuvenated or you know, uh, SARC charter can be amended to make any particular changes? Okay, uh, okay, Aditya, thank you for that question. And I believe that question was also from your nationalist point of view. So uh, what I would say is uh, nationalism is required. Um, uh, these kinds of things make a, make a, make a nation uh, stay where it is. Uh, it makes it stable, it makes it uh, internally powerful, but it should not come at a cost of lives of people or any kind of uh, violent measures that would uh, further deteriorate the living conditions of the people of the own re those regions. Now, you're absolutely correct that the, the issue of Jammu Kashmir and the rising tensions of India and Pakistan has made India-Pakistan what it is now. But at the expense of the people, the rights of people of Jammu Kashmir, and also uh, many contentious issues that has impacted the South Asian region as a whole. Uh, the India-Pakistan conflict has not only affected those two nations, but also the SAC summits, as I mentioned in my presentation. After the 6th summit that was held in Nepal, in Kathmandu, no any summits have been held. So I think uh, nationalism is important for the country's internal uh, unity, internal strength, internal strength and internal power. But when it comes to international world, when it comes to regionalism as a block, South Asia as a block, which holds around 40% of the world population, we, need, we should also look forward towards uh, making this block a united block a powerful one so that we could uh, cooperate with one another by somewhat sacrificing the nationalist principles to some extent, but not to a large extent. And then ensuring that we have a very cordial relationship with one another, which would not only help us in resolving the disputes, but also uh, to make ourselves economically flourish and make our politics stable as well. So thank you. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Prithi, and thank you, Aditya, for that question. Very uh, good question and a good reply as well. Well, our, our next uh, presenters are an interesting one because they're a couple, there are two of them. So we have Akib Mushtaq and Nasir Ahmed Bhatt, students from the lovely Professional University, India. And they are going to be talking about something that we raised uh, during Prithi's presentation, which is Jammu and Kashmir, the Kondurim, and South Asia peace and the way forward. Welcome to our next Yeah, good morning, ma'am. I will be the uh, presenter, first one, who will uh, start with the history and give a bit uh, information about Jammu and Kashmir and the conundrum that has uh, unraveled uh, recently. Uh, Jammu, and, Jammu and Kashmir, uh, which is a, uh, which is a, um, a part that's, been, that's held by India, and after 47, after the independence of uh, India um, from the British rule, they have fought nearly four wars, that's uh, of the 47, 65, 71, and 99. But the uh, recent move, these, uh, India has, India has, um, in, uh, it, it, there were uh, various vicious uh, moves by India um, to, Curb, to curb the Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir, um, uh, but the but the recent move of uh, of, of India uh, uh, after the 370, after the abrogation of Article 370 and 35A, this this has unra unraveled. Uh, uh, this has uh, unraveled various uh, like they have uh, uh, pricked uh, Pakistan, China, as Imran Khan has uh, said from the United Nations um, uh, platform that 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 this will this will lead to a nuclear war. And what we recently saw in the Galwan Valley, um, these, these, these all are the issues that uh, pertain to the um, abrogation of Article 370. India has, from, from the beginning, uh, like they have undone with the various uh, constitutional, uh, constitutional issues, like uh, the arresting of Sheikh Abdullah. They have done it various times. <laughs> And recently, in the 370 move, the, this this was done more uh, uh, like uh, they they curtailed the internet. There was the gag was put, um, and this uh, like arresting of Sheikh Abdullah in the 19, 1953 and 54, scrapping of post uh, of prime ministership in 64, and the rigging of election of uh, 87. These all led the uh, militancy and eventually the uh, 
exodus of uh, pandits kashmiri pandits was uh, also there now i uh, request my hello nasir ahmed but continue further so basically uh, we are talk, talk, talking about the conundrum of kashmir it, the conundrum starts basically from 1947 there's a lot of history to it it starts with a lot of betrayals um, the abrogation the uh, the prime ministership of sheikh abdullah the 1987 uh, the rigging of elections uh, we set in militancy of 1989 and uh, later on uh, uh, it also there was uh, there was this kashmiri pandit issue which which still lingers in the kashmir history so uh, our uh, presentation is basically divided into uh, uh, two parts there is where india has gone wrong in kashmir and where pakistan has gone wrong in kashmir i know the kashmir is no where india has gone wrong let, let 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 me see where pakistan has gone wrong pakistan has uh, always you know fomented terrorism it has supported the terror groups Uh, Pakistan never abides by its uh, treaties agreements. That's why India has always been reluctant to sign any treaty or ag uh, agreements with it. There, there has always been military coups, martial laws have been imposed in Pakistan. This was the reason, you know, why uh, Vajpayee was also reluctant in 2002 to sign that uh, Musharraf Vajpayee formula also. it was also uh, recently it was also highlighted by happy mom jacob in his article that uh, if we go back to 2000 and to 2002 and 2007 formula formula we will see a lot of peace in kashmir uh, there is a difference between the bjp way of looking into kashmir and vajpayee uh, way of looking into kashmir you know bjp uh, more more or less sees it through a nationalistic perspective vajpayee was uh, more of a, more of an accommodative person who believed uh, who believed in humanity and humanitarian we were uh, we were looking at kashmir then uh, that was also um, that was also continued by manmohan singh up to 2007 uh, where india has gone wrong is uh, recently the abrogation or watering down of Art article 370 and 35a uh, now uh, the abrogation uh, or the watering down of article 370 and 35a has uh, unraveled kashmir both internally as well as externally externally is the south asian dimension where uh, you know pakistan is all over uh, against uh, india i uh, uh, initially you know india india didn't uh, 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 india india was not uh, worried about uh, the uh, the pakistan taking it to international forums and all but uh, there are a lot of analysts who believe that uh, the talk of aksa chin by amit shah in the parliament you know that uh, triggered the chinese move in ladakh and the Ganwa, galwan valley incident happened uh, aksa chin is uh, uh, what we believe as uh, what we believe is aksa chin is very sensitive issue for uh, for china in uh, uh, india as uh, india has done uh, you know occurred its lot of uh, south asian neighbors including bangladesh including nepal you know our recent previous speaker mr pratik also talked about it we should uh, india should what we recommend is india should go back again back to sark uh, sark scheme of uh, sark scheme of things and uh, for that we recommend that uh, it should go again back to 2002 and 2007 formula Uh, that that will be better. What uh, what Mr. Modi tried to do is he tried to do a lot of informal summits like there was Wuhan Wuhan spread. We talked a lot of a lot about that, but China responded with um, moves in Ladakh and uh, Galwan Valley. What uh, we believe is that India should go back to Pakistan. There should be a lot of talks, a lot of dialogue, so that uh, you know peace prevails in Kashmir. Thank you. This was our presentation. thank you to both of you and again you have kept to the time a uh, very interesting aspect on the oxide chain i think we should uh, i hope that we can discuss that further um any uh, questions from the audience at this point okay so maybe we'll move on to the next speaker uh and i am sure that the jammu kashmir issue is going to come back again and again when we open it out to a larger discussion so stay tuned uh is and um, i i'm sure this will come back in, in, in 
in our discussion, something that we can leave out. So our next speaker is uh, Mr. Sunil Kumar Chaudhary. He's a PhD candidate from the Northeast Normal University, China. And he's going to be speaking today on lockdown, loosening, and South Asia's growth perspective. Interesting to hear from you from China mm -hmm. on uh, the South Asian growth perspective. So mm -hmm. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you, uh, the respected chair Neha Bansov, and thank you, Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement, for the opportunity to participate in the International Young Scholar Summit. Uh, so, yeah, my topic is uh, lockdown, loosening, and South Asia's growth prospect. So, as we know, that uh, the South Asia, mostly uh, the comprising South countries, uh, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, and Nepal. Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. The region is home to 1.8 billion people, and some of the countries have world's most densely populated cities. And coronavirus uh, disease has continued to spread, spread, and containment measures have greatly disrupted the economic activities in this region. So the number of COVID-19 cases in South Asia alone is over 5.4 million uh, as of September. Uh, 13 of 2020. So, out of which South Asia is accounting for almost 19% of the total worldwide cases, while India alone has almost 87% of the total South Asian cases. So, in order to control the spread of the virus, all the South Asian countries have imposed lockdown as containment measure in their mass, which has resulted into shutdown of the economic activities. Now, many economies have started to exit their lockdowns to, uh, like to uh, elevate the economy. The ongoing pandemic of COVID-19 has caused economic downturn in almost everywhere worldwide, in which South Asia is not an exception. So in this scenario, economic and financial crisis cannot be ruled out, and social and economic unrest due to increase in unemployment as large mass of migrant workers from this region work abroad and they are back to their home country. So there is a chance of huge, uh, not a chance, this is, this is like huge un unemployment uh, increase. So uh, according to the World Bank, South Asia is likely to experience its worst economic performance in the last 40 years uh, with contraction in all eight countries of this region. So according to the latest data from the Asian Development Outlook, South Asia will contract by uh, 3% uh, in 2020 as pandemic mitigation measures in the consumption and services activity and also uncertainty about the course of the pandemic uh, disrupts the private investment as well. However, it is expected to stage the recovery in 2021 when growth is projected to 4.9%. India, the biggest economy in the South Asia, has slowed economic uh, development, economic growth in uh, 2019 to 4.2%, which is less than the uh, previous years. The Indian economy, economy is expected to contract by 4% in 2020, then grow by 6.2% in the following year as economic activity normalizes gradually. Uh, in case of Pakistan, uh, the second largest economy uh, of the region has, uh, before 20, uh, COVID-19, it has a path, uh, in the, it was on the path of economic growth. But however, COVID-19 outbreak has restricted the economic activity. Growth will be contracted by uh, about 0.4% in 2020. Once the COVID-19 impact decreases, uh, Pakistan will resume if he forced to address economic imbalances and initiate structural reforms, like uh, then the economic growth will be projected to 2% in 2021. Uh, in other uh, countries like Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal are likely to grow in 2020, but with the pandemic affecting the last quarter of their fiscal years, their growth projections are downgraded. So Bangladesh had a strong growth before the pandemic, but COVID-19 has hit export earnings and remittances are likely to have fallen sharply. So
So GDP growth there is projected to slow to 4.5% in 2020, but the uh, but it will recover to 7.5% in 2020 uh, due to the uh, help of a strong manufacturing in Bangladesh. In case of Nepal, it has uh, recently found its way back to the political instability, uh, long political instability. Uh, so it has been just two to three years that the country has back to the uh, political stability situation and was displaying a renewed focus on growth and its GDP growth was increased to 7% in 2019. This was a result of continued microeconomic stability and a boost of for domestic consumption uh, from remittances and for aggregate demand from public infrastructure investments. As COVID-19 affected construction, transport, tourism, wholesale and retail trade, the and uh, remittances, which was uh, almost 30% of the GDP of Nepal. So in, in the in decrease in the remittances also has uh, reduced the demand for the consumption and other sectors. So the estimated GDP growth will be 2.3% in 2020, which is dropped by more than two thirds from 2019. So growth is uh, 29, growth in 2021 is projected to 3.1%. Uh, which is still below the previous trend. In case of Bhutan, uh, it, it, it closes border, uh, borders, which affects the tourism and manufacturing construction, which depend on migrant labor from India. So the effect of COVID-19 may be greater in 2021 than in 2020 in case of Bhutan. GDP growth rate uh, is therefore projected at 2.4% in 2020, before falling to 1.7% in 2021. Uh, in case of Afghanistan, Maldives, and Sri Lanka, will bear the full impact of COVID-19 in 2020 uh, fiscal year, with their economy expected to contract significantly. In case of Afghanistan, transport and tra trade are disrupted by international border closures, and remittances fell sharply as many Afghans return from work overseas. So this fragile economy is expected to contract by almost 4.5% in 2020. Uh, according to the World Bank, oh, sorry, yeah, uh, I will try to wrap up. According to the World Bank, Maldives will be worst hit economy in the region as the high in tourism has not received tourist arrival since March and could see its economic output shrink by as much as 13, 13%. Economic growth collapsed and the economy is expected to contract by 11.3% in 2020. Uh, Sri Lanka's forecast for 2020 is downgraded to contraction by 6.1% with stringent domestic lockdown measures and global spill over from the COVID-19. Uh, the, if the pandemic dissipates in 2021, these three econ, uh, economies, uh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, and Afghanistan, uh, is likely to grow by, uh, for example, Afghanistan is likely to grow by 3%, uh, Maldives is likely to grow by 13.7%, and uh, Sri Lanka is likely to grow by 4.1% uh, if the recovery is expected to be particularly strong in high in tourism sector. So while the pandemic continues to spread throughout the region, containment measures have started to ease and economic activity has resumed somewhat in many countries in this uh, region since late May. Uh, the recovery is, is the result of the easing of lockdown restrictions as well as the rapid implementation and unprecedented scale of supportive policies by central banks and governments. So the authority in the region have applied significant fiscal and monetary support to fight the pandemic and cushion its adverse impact. However, the partial and slow reopening of economies as infections continue to rise makes for a difficult growth environment. So government have to ramp up action to curb the health emergency, protect their people, especially the poorest and most vulnerable, and set the stage now for fast economic recovery. So the government should initiate temporary work program for migrant workers and debt relief for business and individuals while cutting red tape on essential imports. So securing a sustained recovery and emerging Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I am about to finish. So, securing a sustained economy, uh, a sustained recovery, and emerging stronger from the Great Lockdown will require action on three fronts. First, the health crisis must be brought to an end, durably and everywhere. Second, the people need to be able to find productive jobs. 
this requires preventing excessive from bankruptcy and creating an environment for job rich growth and finally uh, the future must be more sustainable and inclusive than our past so this requires policies to arrest global warming and reverse rising inequalities so this is my presentation thank you very much for the time thank you uh, well the writing is on the wall i don't see the covid crisis abating and uh, it uh, it's uh, a sobering thought to hear that we are going to see, as as if I understood what you said correctly, that we are going to see the economic effects more acutely in 2021. And uh, tourism is something that uh, you know is a product that we sell as South Asians, Afghanistan, uh, Maldives, Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. and of course that's going to be hit along with migrant workers. Uh, are there any questions from um, the audience? Those joining us. Well, I have, uh, you know, I'm, with no questions coming in, I think we'll take them at the end. But uh, I seem to have um, an increasing privilege of asking all speakers there for the questions. Well, uh, the, the World Bank report that you quoted, I think it was from April this year, 2020. Uh, it also talks about the need as one solution, important one, and, and that has been also the writing on the wall for a while, which is easing of uh, interregional Custom. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also know that the region suffers from something called para tariffs, which is an extra tariff that is put on additionally after you agree to the tariffs between two countries. Mm -hmm. how, how are we going to go about this? Mm -hmm. Given all the bilateral tensions and, and all of that that's happening. Yeah, it, uh, yeah based on like, uh, uh, if the bilateral tensions uh, uh, put aside, and if uh, these uh, eight countries like uh, work together and to boost their economies, yeah, there must, uh, there should be the decrease in the tariffs. But um, due to the recent tensions, political uh, tensions, they, they are not uh, in a position to do that. So they, they think of their own country. Is this uh, instead of uh, regionalism? Here, most of the countries they are like. Uh, uh, applying the individualism, like national, uh, first national interest. They are looking at the first national interest. So uh, it is difficult, uh, like there, there should be a, a mutual understanding because there, there are SAFTA, SAFTA between SAR countries, but they are not in full functional level, right? So this has somehow disrupted uh, this uh, thing. But, However, between Nepal and India, the trade is almost 70% uh, uh, export and import from Nepal is with India. So, uh, but uh, there is still some uh, customs uh, hurdles and disruptions, which sometimes due to the political uh, misperceptions happens. So, yeah, there should be like uh, a common ground to like maybe like European Union or some, some concepts like that. This might uh, help the region to grow faster and India's role will be major in this scenario as India is the largest economy in the region. Thank you so much, Pratik. And from what I've sorry. Seen from the last, uh, uh, sorry, uh, you know, from the last uh, speakers is that there is, um, during this COVID time, this strong trend of nationalism that that is there, you know, whether it's in the economic sphere, whether it's in terms of conflicts um, and, you know, territorial claims. Uh, and let's hope that that's temporary because uh, COVID is going to require for the region to work more closely together. And therefore, uh, with that, I want to invite our next um, speaker for the morning, Shweta Kumari, who is a PhD candidate from the Jawaharlal Nehru University, India. And she is going to be talking exactly about this integrated approach towards health security, prospects for India and its neighbors. Welcome, Shweta. Shweta on the line. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Chair, for
for the kind introduction and uh, a very good morning to all. Uh, before starting my presentation, I would like to extend my uh, thank you to Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement for making me a part of this vibrant summit. Uh, uh, I hope, like my fellow speakers, I will be able to contribute on the theme of this session, which is understanding South Asia uh, through my topic, Integrative Approach Towards Health Security, Prospects for India and its Neighbors. So as it is being dis discussed in this session, uh, today, when, today we are living in a time when COVID-19 has almost house arrested the entire group. And in this scenario, the state of public health system, be it uh, uh, World Health Organization or gov individual government institutions, they are under rigorous scrutiny. And departing from the general understanding in, in the international relations, where usually it is considered that global south or regions like South Asia will remain more vulnerable in case of outbreaks of epidemics or war or occurrence of natural disasters, this pandemic has claimed hundreds of thousands of lives almost symmetrically in all nations. If one looks at these statistics, the highest numbers of casualties have occurred in either in developed and, or in fairly advanced countries. Uh, suppose if we take the example of United States, uh, it is paradoxical that despite having the best medical technologies and the highest per capita GDP spending in the healthcare sector, the country alone accounts for approximately 20% of the total deaths caused by coronavirus. Indeed, there are many reasons behind it, but one of the prominent analysis has been the pre-existing health conditions of these COVID-19 patients, such as hypertension, diabetes, obesity, mental illness, cardiovascular disease, that has lead to comorbidity, a term that we all must have heard a lot in the recent months. As per the data released by U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the death rates in these patients are 12 times more in comparison with those who don't have these conditions. Said that, the outreach and intensity of the coronavirus pandemic have positioned public health crises as one of the most significant non-traditional security threats. We, we talk about the possibilities of two countries uh, going into a conflict. We talk about the possibility of uh, the fear of a nuclear warfare. But here, there is a health crisis uh, that has created havoc all over. So any country with such vulnerabilities will not only be prone to lose its human capital, but it will also tend to see an economic downslide, which is quite evident in the present times. Uh, the question then arises that how can health security, which seems like an abstract connotation, can be achieved? And also do, as a subcontinent, India and its neighbors have a significant role to play in this. So the main proposition in my paper is that one of the effective approaches towards enhancing health security could be the promotion of integrative health practices. So in the recent years, it has been seen that the idea of wellness and holistic health through the inclusion of some of the traditional and non-conventional health practices in conventional medical system through evidence-based scientific research has become quite popular in the healthcare debates. So uh, certainly there is no direct correlation uh, established yet between the cure of COVID-19 and traditional medical practices. However, there is a vast possibility of the preventive role that these body and mind practices play. These can help the human race to overcome modern lifestyle-based ailments and thus re can reduce the vulnerabilities remarkably. Uh, as we all know, uh, some of the prominent practices like yoga, meditation, Ayurveda, they have their roots in the South Asian region, which and uh, the efficacy of these practices are now backed by scientific research and they are gaining tremendous popularity internationally. The declaration of International Day of Yoga by the United Nations was a big leap forward in this direction. 
the who's traditional medicine strategy highlights the need of the member states uh, uh, to develop proactive policies and to implement action plans that will strengthen the role of traditional medicine practices is uh, in keeping the populations healthy again if i take the example of united states uh, it has uh, now developed uh, a federal agency that is called National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Although it is in its nascent stage, but it has started working in the promotion of these complementary and integrative health approaches and also creating awareness among the masses. Uh, <clears throat> some of the prominent agencies like the U.S. Department of Defense have already incorporated yoga and meditation in their overall healthcare framework to help not only the veterans, but also the deployed personnel. Now, coming back to the region, South Asia. So countries like India, Nepal, Myanmar, Sri Lanka are not only home to these therapies and practices, but they also have a lot of potential to emerge as a hub of integrative health modalities, as well as tap revenues from health tourism. Although it is very convenient to float this idea, but there are many obstacles to this. Firstly, there is existence of a parochial bias towards these practices in the uh, conventional or the mainstream health system, which can be removed only, only through uh, rigorous scientific investigations by, uh, by collaboration uh, among these countries and also collab in collaboration with agencies like WHO and NCCIH. The second problem is the question of legitimacy. So in order to overcome fraud and quakery and to promote uh, health tourism, the government agencies, they can provide a license or certificate to private agencies and complementary health providers uh, so that uh, this can go in a more positive direction. The Indian Ministry of Ayush has taken some initiatives in direction, but it is a long, long road to go. Adequate funding and a proper legal framework will be required in this direction. In the end, again, I would like to emphasize that uh, the ever increasing global popularity and wider acceptance of these practices uh, especially in the Western countries, are push factors towards the mo model of integrative health. The preventive nature uh, of these practices can prove helpful in achieving health security in a cost-effective manner and will help both advanced as well as the poorer countries. So India and its neighboring countries with state-of-the-art knowledge of traditional therapies and health practices can emerge as major players in this avenue uh, that I believe. And I would like to conclude that in order to develop an integrative approach, which seems to have a bigger role in the future of healthcare, what is needed is the identification of the importance of this issue and the determination to proceed through cooperation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veta. I think you make a very, very interesting uh, presentation. And especially by actually uh, highlighting the fact that, you know, some of these countries with the best health systems have pre-existing morbidities. And it really calls us to action in terms of what are we doing with our lifestyles as we get into urban spaces, more development, etc. Are we regressing health-wise? And you also make an excellent point by saying that, you know, the region and, you know, countries uh, have a different way traditional way of approaching uh, you know wellness and that's something that can be uh, brought back on the table including the potential for health tourism excellent points and so uh, what I will do is we also have another speaker who's talking about health and COVID during COVID so I will invite um, you know the speaker to speak so that we can take questions collectively around um, you know integrative health sure. and we get different perspectives so with that, I want to invite um, Aditya Guadra Shivamurti. He is a graduate from the London School of Economics and Political Science, UK. And he's going to be talking um, related to what Shweta was talking, which is COVID in South Asia, unpacking 
and overcoming issues related to health and security. Hi, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for having me today and thank you, Nis, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to present. Um, and also, thank you, Shweta, uh, for covering up what I was about to speak uh, to some extent. Um, so, um, first thing I would, I would try to speak about is, uh, in my paper, is trying to link health and uh, security in South Asian region, uh, exclusively the internal security of South Asian region. So, what I would intend to do is first um, emphasize on how health infrastructure and lack of health infrastructure that I would emphasize has exacerbated and uh, led up to more disease burdens in South Asia that has its implications on the internal security of the region. Uh, and the final section uh, would then conclude that we need health security in South Asia, especially through SARC. And in this way, we can overcome uh, challenges posed by both health and security uh, to the region. Uh, now, the first section would, would be uh, mere facts of um, health infrastructure and health burdens in South Asia. Um, but being an observant of most of these countries being developed countries face very similar challenges uh, of fundamentalism, you know, internal conflicts, external conflicts, uh, geopolitical rivalries, poverty, uh, unemployment, population growth, and uh, huge population density. Uh, now, this makes it difficult for governments from all the eight countries of South Asia to moderately invest in health infrastructure and uh, development or uh, to provide a universal health coverage. Uh, now, this has over the time led to exacerbation of diseases and um, um, intensifying disease burdens. So, for example, um, out of three countries that still suffer from polio, two of them are in South Asia, being Pakistan and Afghanistan. And uh, over 40% of world's uh, TB cases are still found in South Asia and uh, 2.26 million cases of HIV AIDS, which still tend to be increasing over the point of time, uh, happens to be in South Asia. Now, another recent example is with COVID-19. Uh, we find 5 million plus counting cases from today's perspective, and the cases are increasing on a day-to-day basis. Um, so this has a huge impact on disease burdens. And as, we, as, as I uh, pointed out through uh, polio, uh, to, sorry, through HIV uh, and TB cases, now, comparing, uh, now going to an inter-regional assessment of South Asia and other regions, uh, we find this lack of health infrastructure within the South Asian countries uh, drawing the region of South Asia um, away from most of the other regions as well when it comes to this uh, infrastructure uh, development. So, for example, we see uh, South Asia is the government with least general government expenditure with least health expenditure for the South Asian, uh, for, the, for the health expenditure. It has also... Um, it has also the least hospital beds per uh, civilians ratio. It has the highest domestic private health expenditure. It has the second highest populated region. Um, and it has the second last physicians, nurses, midwives, and surgical workforce ratio. And also um, second most vulnerable to communicable disease deaths. Now this, makes, this gives us a hint that diseases in South Asia and health burdens in South Asia um, cannot be prevented easily and cannot be limited as well. So these come with overlying implications, um, multifaceted implications, uh, and one of those important being the security implications of um, health. Um, so as recently pointed out by previous speakers, um, especially the economic implications of uh, crisis, so I would like to point out um, none of these uh, implications are free with um, what, what happens to be in the security perspective as well. Um, so first thing is the limit that has been through lockdown on tourism, trade, um, businesses, confidence, uh, business investments and business confidences has gradually impacted GDP and economic growth of these South Asian economies. And this happens to be uh, so and so that the governments have already deviated their GDP uh, or the plan activities from day to day activities to the crisis resolution or crisis management. and. Um, so, for example, uh, most of the um, uh, most of the assumptions go that the South Asian countries, uh, South Asian regions' economic growth would be from 2.8 percent to somewhere uh, negative, which might extend with if the lockdown or if the COVID crisis exacerbates. And um, in alone, if we see uh, standalone case, India has dropped to minus 28.5 percent um, in in this quarter. So this 
comes with implications that has it on security. So a 2013 uh, study published um, by Springer, a journal a study published by Springer by four authors in the Quality and Quantity Journal states that there's one person, if one percent increase in per capita income of South Asian countries lead to reduction of terrorism and conflicts by 0 0.895 percent. Um, so with the GDP being hindered and which has impacts over GDP per capita, uh, we see whatever investments that the government has done in, uh, in, uh, in initiating peace and whatever investments it has done in has come to a steady halt, especially when it comes to radical, limiting radicalization and terrorism. So this um, has an implication on the security situation of South Asia. Then comes inequality. Um, South Asia has a huge informal economic uh, running around with people now being unemployed. Uh, because of the COVID crisis situation and uh, unemployment. Now, this has led to uh, crime and increase in um, vulnerability to radicalization. As the previously quoted, um, cited uh, publication says that South Asia has been a hub of uh, radicalization and terrorism for two reasons, being unemployment and poverty grievances that has led to radicalization of many individuals. Now, another example that I would like to quote is the 2020 Bangalore riots in uh, early August where most of the uh, participants uh, of the riots were either unemployed or informal were, were in the informal economy who had lost their jobs in the COVID-19 crisis. Um, now then comes another uh, major aspect that is poverty. Over 16% of people um, uh, in South Asia suffer from poverty. And um, as, as early, earlier pointed out that the health expenditure, private health expenditure and out of pocket health expenditure is highest in South Asia which pushes over 3.06% of people to poverty line. Um, this, sorry, okay, uh, do I have two minutes? Yes, you have two minutes. Sorry. Um, so as scholars have earlier pointed out, such as Keen or any other scholar that has already uh, pointed out on internal conflicts or grievance part of the internal conflict, it is obvious that this is gonna have an impact on uh, left-wing extremism, especially in, in uh, be it Maoism in India or uh, as seen earlier in the Nepal, um, in the in, in the Nepal uh, civil unrest earlier in the uh, Maoist phase, where inequality, poverty, and unemployment were one of the main reasons for mobilization against the state, and were used as reasons to uh, act against the state. Then comes political implications. Every state has the responsibility to protect its civilians. When it fails to do so, if it is not efficient to do so, um, several non-state actors come into play. Uh, example of it would be Jamat ud Dawa, the parent organization of Lashkar e Taiba in Pakistan, which has provided various um, healthcare services and mobilized popular support for whatever was happening in Kashmir. Um, and also, as seen recently with uh, the Naga Socialist Council, um, comments on how inefficient the federal government of Nagaland was. This comes in a situation where the federal governments enjoy less legitimacy and the state actors, non state actors, tend to exploit it. And um, then comes the uh, security vacuum section. Uh, so when a crisis breaks out, either the armed forces are deployed to enforce lockdown, rescue operation, or infrastructure development, and also uh, the government has to deviate its budget from military spending to um, elsewhere. So this creates a security vacuum, which has been exploited as seen in the 15th April uh, small-scale ISIS attacks in Maldives, uh, also increase in uh, border terrorism of Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, border regions. Uh, similarly, um, over 4,000 Navy personnel uh, of Sri Lanka were quarantined recently and also 1,500 US troops were quarantined in Afghanistan, which creates a security vacuum, leaving non-state actors to exploit it um, and, and, in, and uh, exacerbate the conflicts. Now comes the final section of the uh, security aspect, that's bioterrorism. So these um, loopholes of state being inefficient or unable to cover up most of this issue uh, leaves space for non-state actors to uh, indulge or uh, to uh, recognize that bioterrorism can be one aspect where it can terrorize the state or it can terrorize its civilians. Uh, so, and most of the uh, organizations such as Al-Qaeda or ISIS, which are trying to gain their ground, have already gained their ground, uh, have quite links with failed states, with bioweapons. So it seems quite a harmful trend if this tends to be continued. And um, so the third section and the final section would be on... Um, why regional why and how regional health security is needed in south asia so the for this i would point out four reasons one is the global health security has always been as most of them time been western centric and uh, been western funded for its own national interest and for its own national concerns second is second and third is health and security neither have uh, they cannot be limited by domestic um, 
by domestic initiatives alone they have transnational effects and due to social economic uh, you know um, ethnic and historic reasons south asia has been the reason for more um, civilian to civilian contact which le leads to more um, health and uh, security concerns to be covered up with and then comes a uh, lack of cooperation with sarc so if we try to bring in a non traditional security aspect to cooperate on it might help bridge um, sarc to cooperate on issues that have already been dominating um, due to um, interstate rivalries and then uh, i would like to conclude that south asian countries need to um, um, enhance their health security by using uh, more mechanisms of detection and reporting such as the laboratories or uh, epidemic intelligence sarc epidemic intelligence center to be established or responding to these uh, diseases um, holistically uh, enhancing health diplomacy and regular fundings uh, to overcome health issues within the sarc and then uh, prevention of these diseases by considering sarc development goals or um, you know uh, approaching one health policy um, and also um, to overcome the interstate rivalries and internal conflicts so yeah that's it thank you thank you thank you uh, well i hope uh, bioterrorism is something that we find a way to regulate and you know move around especially after uh, you know especially after covid and let's hope that that doesn't come back uh, or maybe it does but I, I wanted to leave you and Shweta with two questions, which we will come back to as when we open up, uh, you know, the discussion. Which is starting with you first. Um, you know, you raised the point on GDP, and um, you also know that the region, uh, countries in the region, um, despite what is happening uh, on the health front, are actually investing more in their purchase of arms than on health and other social policy areas, despite what we are seeing. Uh, what do you have to say about that? And also given the fact that while that is happening, you also have, you know, we had previous remittances from say nurses who were going out into the Gulf countries and other areas who have now come back home, you know, they've come back to the region. And is there a potential to sort of get them back into, you know, the, the mainstream of, uh, providing their services back into the local economy, national economy. That's a right. question for you, Aditya. But a joint question for you both, uh, Shweta and Aditya, is the fact that Aditya raised this question about uh, fundamentalism. And uh, Shweta, you raised this question about, you know, whole wellness, uh, you know, com uh, comprehensive wellness. Religion is something that is uh, very, very intrinsic to the region. And there's a, uh, there's a experiment and a prog project that's been done in China with the support of Harvard, which is looking at how religion and family together can provide that wellness, you know, just belief, the faith. So how do you see something that's actually the gun on one side, which is creating security and threat perceptions on the other, on one side, religion and identity politics, and the potential for that in health security for the region? So I'm going to leave you with these two questions and we'll come back to it during the discussion. And uh, we'll move on to uh, Sayak Roy. And sorry, Sayak, you were actually the next in line and we kept you waiting. Sayak? No problem. Is a... Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Uh, Sayak Roy is a teaching assistant at the University of uh, Delhi, where I studied too. Uh, and he is going to be talking about smart city aesthetics and everyday geographies of South Asian countries. Very, very important. Okay, cool. So can I start? Yes, please. You have eight minutes. Uh, hello? We can hear you and you can start. You have eight okay. minutes. Okay. Okay. Just let me share the screen first. I have a small PPT. Uh, hello, uh, can, can you people see that just for the information? We can see you. Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, yeah, from COVID. Uh, okay, first let me introduce. Hi, I'm Sayak and I have completed my MPhil from University of Cape Town uh, in Urban Studies. And I did my master's from the Delhi School of Economics uh, under the Geography Department. And um, from COVID now we are moving to the smart city 
uh, I am quite sure most of you already hear about it a lot. And because it's a new poster boy of the city making. So the, uh, my title is that the smart city and localized geographical space, aesthetics and everyday geographies of South Asian cities. Uh, okay, boom, that's really uh, quite heavy, but I'm sure as the presentation progress, you will start making sense and I'll break it down. So let's, let's first focus on the picture that I collected from one of the Indian smart city. The, the, the best Indian smart city as per government is Bhubaneswar. I collected the picture from the smart city website. I actually bring that picture to just as the entry point for my argument. That if you look at the picture is the Bhubaneswar city, which have a, it's, it's known as the temple town of India. And the photograph is showing the temple and then there is a this 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 mid, in the middle there is a governor house or and the assembly and is also showing it's a number one smart city so this this picture is actually talking about how smart city is uh, is a global concept but it's so locally it's so locally connected and contextualized so that's the argument i'm making through this presentation so let's begin Okay, so uh, just a bit to recap. So uh, what is smart city? So the smart city is basically, uh, we talk about is a technological intuition that people believe, the, the city believe that every each and every function operation is all controlled by the technologies and technology govern city making. And this smart city concept actually came in the, uh, in the in the world in 2008 when the financial crisis happened and then the capitalist capitalist and all the ruling power decided we need something to be consumed and that's why they made this dystopian version of city which is known as smart city and the basic idea of smart city one is that is transferring the power power from the political bodies like municipality state towards the private stakeholder, like the major companies like IBM, Cisco, all this private organization become the ruler of the city. And the smart city concept also evolve over time. When is 2008, it came, it looked like, you know, all the cities need to be looked like the New York or Singapore. And then gradually the other countries realized that it's a distant dream. It would be possible because of their context. And that's why they now, uh, there's a new turn, which is called a Southern turn. And they said that we need, need, need a smart city, which will be built based on the local uh, context. And all the South Asian countries like India, Nepal, uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, we are Afghanistan, we all adopted such kind of smart cities. Though uh, the main aim of, now the main aim of my presentation is that those smart city is a global, like a global is a Western concept originated in the Western European or America city, but it traveled towards the South Asian cities like Bhubaneswar, Kathmandu, all, and the, the South Asian countries and the government absorbed it. And I, I just used a cartoon here that think globally, drink locally to just uh, made my point that smart city is a, is a global concept uh, concept that is fine, a Western concept, but we need a local, local understanding, a local context-based smart city. And for that, I'm, I'm, I'm just giving certain provocations that how can we actually develop a localized smart city? So I talked about uh, like oral history, aesthetics, and wall art and the everyday geographies to develop a local smart city. So the first thing is the oral history. I, I actually use because I, I work in my MPhil with the smart city concept and in the policy, especially in India, Nepal, we, we are talking about we need a local best smart city. But what the plan are doing, they're going, the, go, they're going and collecting the history books of a particular city and studied the very flat reading of history, travel guides, some very yes, no online service. I found that it, that is absolutely dubious and depressing because it's, it, it not, it's unable to generate any sort of localized data. It's just for formality and fact. So in my field work, that's why I use that picture. This, this guy is, uh, is an informal street vendor doing business, uh, have been doing business in Bhubaneswar since last 15 years, but he said he is in a crisis. 
that uh, the in the in this photograph there is a back there is a shopping mall they said you go away and the city on the other side municipality in uh, on the road they said we don't want informal street vendor near the main road so he is livelihood in crisis so the so for me this this tilak bhai who is a informal street vendor is the is the biggest historian that planner should look for the other thing is the aesthetics that uh, i i already mentioned that smart city is about to making an iconic city you know bhubneshwar also want to be look like singapore or new york some day but it's obviously a failed dream but they are doing it and the other question is we we need to understand this as well that aesthetic should not be imposed over over the residents you know it like uh, the bhubneshwar or kathmandu there is no need to look like the dublin or some smart cities in sweden they have their own history own aesthetic that need to be come on the left side is it is copied from that from a tourist spot in sweden in a smart city that i love this city now it's a trend in india i love bhubneshwar but is really the residents connect with that we never know and on the right side there is a photograph it's actually painted by an artist is called your city in your hand he painted is before the smart city thing come and then i interviewed he said the north is not any more tight smart city when the smart city have a concept can the city is not any more in our hand so we, we need to look all this aspect the, the third important here is the uh, i talked about the everyday geographies by everyday geographies i mean very simple thing like from where we buy our groceries our our daily life how we commute so i just put an example on the left side there is a heart or the open market in farm market from where the indians and south asian people do their shopping and the smart city is came, on the right side came with a entirely a new shopping mall for the fish you know all lights and all things come so this 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 is this is a just a mimicking of what the other other western or or the reference point is doing we just need to follow it but is there need or is the residents are ready to accept that we should we, there is a need to understand and before making any further plan and impose on the dwellers okay so that's the and the last thing i also found it's very interesting especially to the context of south asia that we have to understand where we are building the smart city for example on the left side the photograph is talking about the smart city kathmandu so which have a very own history it's a hill sites it's a it's a very old city there's a people have their own dynamics so to updating an existing city into a smart city we need really sensible approach if we do lot of technological infrastructural growth we might lose the very basic essence that kathmandu have and then we will just uh, made it something else and also there there is another concept that the smart city also can build from the scratches on the right side it's a site of dholera gujarat it's basically agricultural land that captured and converted into a smart city so and uh, kathmandu uttar also doing that so there we need a different aspect for the different site and in conclusion i'm just uh, restating the point that smart city concept is is maybe driven by the financial capitalism but it's still grounded in localized context a city is always for the people city is not to show off the financial capital is that just look our infrastructure our light our aesthetic come and invest city is fundamentally for the people so for that we need to consider that and through this localized understanding we the south asian countries like india nepal bangladesh uh, sri lanka pakistan we we all just need to form our own model not by model i'm saying a particular reference point just a just a method to know how to get a localized generated data for developing a smart city and uh, i i know there is a very basic question come in the mind that i am i opposing the smart city uh, smart city idea no no i'm i'm not opposing that i also want that uh, in the morning from point 1 to point b, b when the residents or people work as commute they need to they need to move on in the in the smallest time but yeah. that 
Sydney, just yep. press it to end your uh, presentation now because okay, thank you. I'm done. <laughs> by about four minutes. Yeah. Um, okay. So, if you have just something to say in about thirty seconds, so that you can finish your point at least. Yeah. So, so the, the my, my fundamental point is that uh, that's a smart city is a is a is a maybe a Western concept, but uh, we as the South Asian uh, we as the South Asian country, we just need to develop a different methodology to develop our own smart city rather than the copying Dublin or New York. Yes. So that's my point. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it's a valid point and a refreshing one that uh, Bhubaneswar shouldn't look like uh, Singapore. We have Singapore yeah. for that. And, um, you know, there's a writer, Orhan Pamuk from uh, Turkey, who has actually written a lot about this. And there's one book that he has written called The Strangeness in My Mind. And he's talked about the geography of a city that needs to include hawkers and vendors who have been so much a part of our um, culture, you know, of a city. Yeah. But also, I think the question really is, who is the city smart for? Anyway, okay. I'm running out of time. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I would like to invite the next speaker for the morning, who is Harsh S. Nalawade. He is a student from the National Law School of India. And he is going to be talking about something very different but important, situating cyber security in South Asia. And since we are running out of time, I would request you to please keep it to an eight-minute presentation. Over to you. Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Am I audible? Yes. Should I share my screen? You can share your screen and start. Sure. My screen is visible? Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, situating cybersecurity in uh, South Asia. Uh, I'll be taking over these three cores uh, here. Uh, one is uh, cyber vulnerabilities in South Asia, geopolitical implications of cybersecurity in South Asia, and what are the attributes of South Asia? Sorry, uh, cybersecurity. Uh, so at first, South Asia as a whole uh, geographical space, uh, uh, we see that one fifth of the humanity resides here. Uh, most of these uh, states are uh, uh, were former colonies and have attained independence at the same time. Uh, they are also ethnoculturally uh, closer, as was pointed by one of the speaker earlier. Uh, it also has its own regional cooperation called uh, South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. Uh, one peculiar uh, characteristic of this uh, South Asia is they are all digitalizing and they are digitalizing at the same time uh, through various initiatives in their own countries like Digital India, uh, Digital Nepal Initiative, Digital Pakistan and so on. Uh, at the same time, uh, our uh, GDPs are also uh, growing and uh, we are very aspirational in, in that sense. We have also shown robust economic growth. Uh, so uh, what happens is our uh, banking structure and our governance, everything, governance architecture, everything is uh, digitalizing. However, uh, we are not careful about our uh, cyber vulnerabilities. Uh, most of our government and businesses do not invest much on uh, uh, the cyber security aspects. Uh, uh, at the same time, we also see that how uh, there are three nuclear powered nations, uh, if you consider China, in, posited in the South Asia. Right. Uh, so uh, what exactly is cyber attack? Uh, it Simply put, it's a use of computers uh, to launch attack on other computer architecture and such other things. At the same time, uh, what are what is cyber security then so it's a protection of these systems using certain technologies and uh, other measures uh, when you consider cyber vulnerabilities in south asia uh, as i said there were there are laggard uh, adoption of these cyber uh, security measures uh, one of the report released by microsoft in 2016 called malware uh, infection index it shows that uh, pakistan bangladesh nepal india and sri lanka were the top countries exposed to malware threats in the Asia Pacific markets. In fact, a small country like Bhutan are also uh, reported to show their devices being susceptible to the malwares. Uh, these are some of the recent cyber attacks uh, in the South Asian countries. Uh, uh, the most famous, of course, is uh, Bangladesh, Sonali Bank of Bangladesh being attacked and Bangladesh Bank cyber haste, which uh, stormed the entire South Asia. Uh, Maldives also has seen DDoS attacks. Uh, 
Pakistan and India regularly face such uh, cyber attacks. In fact, India recently during the lockdown also fake, uh, uh, was exposed to crypto mining and remote access tool, uh, their kind of malwares on their uh, computers. Nepal also recently uh, in one of their firm called Foodmandu, uh, uh, their data of uh, their data were also compromised, the data of the customers. So what are these risk factors? Uh, one is, uh, of course, uh, you have uh, your banking systems uh, vulnerable to it, and it might bring down your uh, financial institutions. Uh, your political institutions may also fall. The trust and the uh, suspicion factors might increase in the South Asia. Uh, there could be political and social turmoil as well. And they are not just bound, uh, they are not just concerns of the domestic uh, uh, nature only, they also have transnational character. So that brings us to this perspective of geopolitical implication. Uh, so one uh, peculiar example is about the cyber espionage that keeps on propping up every now and then between India and Pakistan. So Indian uh, nationals uh, uh, hacking into the Pakistani military establishment and Pakistani also doing the same to us. Uh, we have also seen how uh, I think Pratik uh, uh, noted that uh, Pakistan, uh, Nepal claimed three territories of Kalapani, uh, Limpia Dhura and uh, Lipu Lake. Uh, so when this was uh, done, when this was claimed by Nepal in their political path, India retaliated by uh, hacking their botanical survey of India's uh, botanical survey of Nepal's uh, you know website. At the same time, Nepal's uh, Brahma and uh, one more organization also retaliated uh, with their cyber attacks on India. We have also seen how Maldivian government uh, has faced uh, attacks in the Nepal uh, in the in their national health agency uh, through what are called as Guy Fox. They are basically anonymous and they trying to send out certain messages to the government saying uh, that, of course, uh, you do not want to be closer with India and you want Maldives government and their employment to the Maldivian people only. Uh, yes, uh, that brings us to the question of uh, the South Asian integration. You know, we are proposing a true integration of South Asia, something along the lines of, say, uh, European organization. However, uh, you see, uh, for example, take uh, this, uh, we are proposing South Asian uh, electricity grid. Once this critical architecture of South Asian grid is being compromised within cyber attacks, what happens is the entire energy security of your South Asia is compromised and completely jeopardized. Uh, so that's a threat to the, the South Asian integration. Uh, yes, we all also have to understand what are the attributes on uh, challenges uh, in the cyber security. Uh, these cyber attacks are completely uncertain. We cannot anticipate it. They are sudden and we cannot say because of this, this happened. Uh, there could be certain tensions along the border. At the same time, we cannot say that this, uh, that was the reason for your attacks on the uh, cyberspace. But the motivations can vary. Motivations are, uh, you know, we cannot say for sure unless someone claims it. Motivations can be like sending out the messages, something in the something that happened in the Maldivian uh, government. Uh, motivations can be even uh, recruiting for terrorism. Motivations can just vary even uh, saying that you're, I do not like your political institution. I want to, I want it to come down. Uh, they also can be very ambiguous and ambiguous in the sense that uh, if there is a cyber attack, the mimicking, the mimicking is so close that you cannot attribute any one particular country as such. Uh, so attribution is a very serious challenge in the cyber security space. Uh, of course, we'll also have to look into how international law uh, uh, you know, international law comes into picture here. Uh, there are two laws uh, that are important here. One is your uh, just add bill and just in bill. So what are these is uh, it refers to your grounds on which your country can justify to go to a war. Also, what are your rights uh, when you are in the war? So what happens is tomorrow, let's say uh, India attacks India, Indian cybersecurity hackers attacks Pakistani establishments or government. Does that give the right to Pakistan? Uh, to uh, you know, go for a full full fledged uh, war. So there are ambiguities in the international law as well. Uh, now I'll also uh, explain why nuclear and cyber security are very close. Uh, according to Harvard professor uh, named Joseph Nye, he says that uh, there are conspicuous commonalities between the nuclear and the cyber security because you have your superiority of offense over defense. Uh, nobody can be uh, for sure cyber defense. We have seen this in the case of Stuxnet when uh, alleged US, USA uh, wanted to thwart the uh, Iranian nuclear uh, missions. At the same time, there are, uh, there are aspects for this uh, first and the second use cases. Uh, there are possibilities of automated responses. And 
uh, fourthly, it's about deployment and use of weapons for strategic purposes. Say some countries uh, exploring the cyber uh, security aspects or uh, cyber offensive strategies. As uh, another country, I would also want to do uh, because as a response and I want to be prepared uh, in, in that scenario. This can have very serious consequences. Like I mentioned in the earlier case that uh, South Asia already possesses three nuclear powers if you consider China as well, Pakistan, India and China. Now, uh, like ambiguity and uh, attribution were a concern, there is another concern here. It can fall into the hands of uh, the non-state actors. In fact, the whole non-state and the state actors in the cyber sp cyberspace becomes blurred. Uh, however, uh, we'll have to understand what we can do about it. Uh, so as a way forward, uh, we have seen there are definitely domestic responses. Nepal has initiated its own computer emergency response teams. Uh, Maldivian government has also done that. Even Bangladesh has done that. Bhutan is also exploring this idea. India also has a uh, cyber security policy 2013, of course, which is outdated today in terms of uh, the developments that takes place in the cyber security space. Uh, but what about the regional level? To summarize. Sure. Uh, so what are the uh, important things that are at the regional level? We definitely have to go for confidence building measures. Uh, this may not be the best. However, uh, we do not see anything uh, better than this as well. We'll also understand how uh, Asian Regional Forum uh, uses uh, cybersecurity in, in their uh, critical aspects. We have to borrow those ideas into the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation initiatives to establish cybersecurity measures here as well. I would like to end this by saying that, of course, uh, we are very sure of why this is required because we want a peaceful, prosperous, and uh, secure South Asia. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Harish. Uh, well, uh, an important point again, the ambiguity in cyber law and uh, on one hand and then the, uh, the use of cyber warfare on the other hand. And I think also apart from using it between countries, cyber warfare is something that has started being used within countries. For example, you know, um, the anti-Islamic, uh, the organized use of uh, media and the digital world for anti-Islamic uh, messages within India, uh, etc. Uh, we move on to our last speaker for the morning, uh, Irfan Emma Nazir. Uh, he's a student again at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, India, and he's going to be talking about Israel UAE peace deal and what that means for the South Asian uh, perspective, a perspective. And uh, just linking it up with the last speaker, India has had sort of a um, partnership with Israel on cyber, you know, the soft uh, cyber warfare sort of tool. So anyway, over to you, Irfan. Thank you, ma'am, for the introduction. Now, today in this presentation, what I intend to do is to look at how South Asia see the recent developments in West Asia. Now, what are these developments? Like, as we know that on 13th August 2020, the Israel and the United Arab Emirates agreed to normalize their relations in a peace deal brokered by the United, United States of America. Now, two days back, if you see, Bahrain has also followed the uh, United Arab Emirates. Then, uh, uh, even uh, Oman is now on the talks, on the negotiation tables for uh, normalizing deals. And all this, being, all this has been done under the blessings of Saudi Arabia. Maybe not soon, maybe under a future King Mohammed bin Salman, we could see Saudi Arabia also normalizing their ties with uh, uh, Israel. Now, what this particular, these developments, the series of developments means to South Asia. Now, we have to, uh, why we need to understand is because of three pertinent reasons. Now, first is the long-standing historical, cultural, and religious interplay between both the regions, South Asia and West Asia. And secondly is the again, long-standing trade relations, which dates back to two millennia uh, between both the regions. And the most reason, but very pertinent, is the amount of human, uh, human mo mobility, the human migration between both the regions. It is the largest uh, human migration corridors in the world, the South Asia, West Asia corridor. So because of these reasons, we need to understand how S South Asia sees this development. Now, uh, if you look, India and Pakistan was the, one of the earliest countries to come up with a statement. Their foreign affairs ministries came up with a statement on the 
deal, the peace deal with uh, Israel and UAE on 14th. Now, uh, what India and uh, Pakistan said in their statements was completely in different poles. Now, India saw this particular deal as an opportunity. It has opened a series of opportunities, as stated by External Affairs Minister S. Jai Shankar. And uh, why it is an opportunity? Because if you look at the relationship between uh, Tel Aviv and uh, Abu Dhabi in the last couple of decades, they, their relationship was cordial and it was fostering, especially under the present regime. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi has taken immense care to develop its uh, relationship with Abu Dhabi and Tel Aviv, particularly a personal rapport with their leaders, Benjamin Netanyahu and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed. And they also have cooperation uh, in uh, various fields from tra trade and co commerce, then the science and technology, defense, energy, all these areas. So, and New Delhi in their statement also mentioned that this particular uh, agreement, accord, is between the two strategic allies, two strategic allies between, of India in the region. So it has opened up a lot of opportunities. Now the New Delhi can uh, come up with a trilateral engagement with uh, these three countries. Maybe uh, uh, they can come up with uh, military exercises, how we see in Indo-Pacific, Indo they can come up uh, similar to that in uh, Arabian Sea, then they can take measures to bolstering counter-terrorism measures, then cooperation in trade and commerce, science and technology, energy, human resources, healthcare, so and so forth. But two questions remain here. What should be the relationship with Tehran? How should we, India, see its relationship with Tehran? That, in, I think, India has given a response to that with the recent visit of External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar to Tehran uh, on the way to Moscow for Shanghai Economic Cooperation. So it has already gave a message that uh, uh, India will have a strong relationship with Tehran also because Tehran is also very important. Iran is very important in terms of strategic interest. It is a gateway to uh, uh, Central Asia and Sabar port is there. So uh, Tehran is important and Palestinian question is final uh, uh, aspect to this. Well, uh, if you look at Palestinian question, my argument would be why should India be more Catholic than the Pope? Because we see all the uh, uh, Arab states are lining up to uh, restore their relation, I mean, establish a, a, a relationship with Israel. So why should India be more Catholic than the Pope? Then, so there comes, uh, at that line, we need to see how Pakistan sees this relation. Uh, I mean, this uh, Israel-UAE peace deal. Now, Islamabad has come up with an immediate statement saying that this particular deal will have a far-reaching implication on uh, the region. And if you see the uh, Pakistani netizens, they are tweeting on uh, 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 tweetings with the page of their passport, which reads that this passport is valid for all the countries in the world except Israel. They were restating their commitment to the Palestinian cause. And uh, if you see in the Pakistani cities, people came in support of uh, Palestinian people. Now, why? Pakistan is emphasizing on Palestine. Palestine is because it is under their larger political project because they want to place Palestine, Palestine and uh, Kashmir under the same umbrella of Islamic Ummah and advocate their cause for, I mean, uh, uh, Kashmir. So if the pa Palestinian... Yes, I will uh, keep in that document. So if they focus on the Palestinian, uh, if the Palestinian cause dies out, so same as the Kashmiri cause. But in the recent years, we see that Pakistan is uh, facing severe backlash in the region, even uh, in the organization of Islamic cooperation, the Arab states are not willing to take up this issue. Then even Pakistan is trying to forge an alliance with uh, Turkey and uh, Iran, which also faced a severe backlash from the Saudis and the Islamabad under Imran Khan, had to take that away, uh, take that proposal. Because they have to look at their again, because the Pakistani state is in a dilemma, because if they forge an alliance with Turkey and uh, uh, Iran, the issue is that they will anger the Arabs. 
and if they anger the arabs it will affect their because the islamabad is heavily dependent on the economic aid of these arab states and major diaspora a major chunk of the diaspora is earning their bread and butter in the west gulf states so the pakistan is in dilemma so in conclusion what i need to say is that this particular deal the abraham accord as the uh, as we say has opened a lot of opportunities for india why because of their pragma pragmatism because of their uh, uh, cordial relationship with israel and the arab states but it has pushed pakistani state into a dilemma what to do like whether they have to forge an alliance with uh, uh, turkey and uh, uh, iran and revive the baghdad pact and uh, or at the cost of their relationship with the arab states with that i conclude thank you thank you so much yes it's a fact that the opportunity lies uh, and it depends on how uae israel and the us actually uh, respond and react to iran and palestine and um, that will have a huge ramification for the south asian region uh, so thank you so much for your presentation and for highlighting both the israel and the iran point with that i want to actually open it out to questions and uh, we don't have too much time we have about um, 15 minutes so i will return to aditya and shweta for the two questions that i asked earlier and thereafter and if you can respond to that very quickly aditya and shweta uh, thereafter we'll take uh, the questions from the audience that has come in so over to you aditya and uh, shweta right uh, i'm audible yes right um so the first question was uh, concerning uh, the gulf nurses and their return uh, back to india so um i'll quick add up there um, i think yeah most of them are returning to india and it would in a way uh, provide few infrastructure backing uh, for this opportunity but i think um, having not invested enough in health and having not invested enough in hospitals or health infrastructure i don't think we can make a lot of them because most of them prefer to go outside not Uh, for employment and also for income purposes so i think that's where we lack to attract these people back to the work and um, the second question is arms preference uh, over the health situation even right now i think it's it's a classic notion that uh, indian state or mostly um, most most of the realists of indian states believe that um, if if the state doesn't survive uh, what else would you do is there anything else is there any alternative because you can't educate your people you can't provide help to your people without defending your state so that's the classic notion they come up with and i think it's going to still continue and unfortunately south asia would still prefer uh, the bullet uh, rather than the bread for now uh, even considering the recent statement that india um, indian um, the jammu kashmir in the jammu kashmir region where the um, inspector had complained that pakistan is sending covid-19 infected uh, insurgents to kashmir so i think it it reflects just a classic uh, bullet preference over the bread preference for now uh, and the third and final question would be on um, about uh, the family uh, values and at the same point of time the regional um, uh, and the fundamentalism i think it's it's a uh, um it we we need to also focus on how uh, insurgency was also taken care in northeast most of the people uh, most of the um, counter insurgency tactics were also used uh, to you know uh, especially women in in the northeast uh, a project called project motherhood on how to take up or look up the your kids to prevent them from getting radicalized so i think family values do uh, matter but again as as most of the people critic it's how we interpret the religion rather than just following the religion blindly so uh so if we interpret the religion and consider our identity as such uh, which makes us more vulnerable to fundamentalism i think then um, it is a it is a dangerous road to walk on and it is a dangerous rope to walk on but i think we need to focus on how we reinterpret the religion and how we um, play a major role in um, bringing back sufi islam for example when compared to deopandi islam so yeah i think that i would i would uh, end up with this thank you so much and over to you shweta very quickly Thank you, uh, thank you, Aditya, for making my task easier by <laughs> highlighting the main points. Uh, uh, I will, uh, as the question integrated religion with uh, the region and health security. So I'll talk. I'll be talking more on that, that aspect. That if we, if this session is focused on understanding South Asia, so if we are talking about South Asia, we cannot leave out religion out of it. 
because it's an old civilization and it has been home to almost all sorts of religion uh, present in the world. So uh, it's very integrated in our system. But what, uh, in my opinion, what is the problem is the colonial legacy uh, that has continued and that connotation ha of religion has been uh, either tied up with fundamentalism or with commun uh, communalism. So that creates the most uh, of the problems. And uh, as we see, many of the health practices, if we see traditional health practices, so it were made in a way in this part of the world, in, the, in this subcontinent, that it was integrated with the religion. And so people were, uh, for example, uh, if someone was sick, they were uh, even now our moms, they give us tulsi ka kadha or something. So the, these are very common things and maybe all of us would be, whether uh, relating it with religion or not, we are doing these practices, we are following it. So, uh, so the problem which, uh, in my opinion, is that the moment that religion was put in a different bracket where you cannot speak about religion in in the first place in the common spaces in uh, academic dialogues when religion was kept out so uh, i think first of all the decolonization of the understanding of religion is very important in the region and to, for south asia to come along like uh, there is a definition of religion uh, that i like very much it, it is given by paramhans yogananda who is also called father of yoga in the West. So he describes religions, uh, he gives two definitions of religion. So the first definition, he says that uh, religion, yes, there are uh, traditions, there are customs, there are ways, and there is an, uh, uh, the primary definition which, which looks at the universality. And that universality of religion has sustained this region. So now uh, we need to put more dialogues that how can we promote the best practices that are, in, that, it, that are ingrained in all of the religions in the region and come forward with the best practices. And just uh, when we are talking about health security, health, uh, as I think uh, one of my fellow uh, uh, speakers, he talked about the Western practices, the dominant of Western practices. Yes, we need. We cannot. We cannot say that we will. Uh, we can remove, deny the efficacy of modern health system. But at the same time, we have something that we can offer, and we can be. As I made in my presentation, that South Asia can become a major player in that. So, uh, religion, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, traditional practices, they have. A very important role to play and if we cooperate if we come along with a solution like it is uh, uh, sometimes we even hesitate in thinking that we can be ahead of the western world in something although we have everything so this idea this colonial uh, 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 understanding we need to come over through academic debates positive interactions so that will be my answer and there is one question pointed to me that can India in the chat. Uh, we will take that later. We are okay. actually running out of time. But uh, okay, sure. fascinating point about the decolonization of religion and how we've fallen into that trap. Fascinating point, absolutely. We have exactly, unfortunately, I think each of your presentations has been so interesting and I've been just buzzing with questions and uh, need for interaction. We have five minutes um, and... Uh, uh, so I'm going to ask one question which summarizes the questions that have come from the audience. Um, and I'll give each of you, uh, you know, a minute or a little less than a minute to answer this. Uh, basically, the question is from Pratik and uh, Sunil, which is, uh, and several others, which I'm grabbing. Uh, you know, SAF doesn't uh, have the mandate to discuss bilateral issues. It has the mandate to discuss regional issues. And uh, therefore, it would make it more uh, valuable if the, the countries in the region use this to discuss common issues related to the region. If you can answer this question in terms of the area that you picked up, for example, um, you know, a uh, city is or on the issue of health, how can that, each of your issues that you picked up, health, 
how can that be discussed at a regional level at the SAC and how can we use that platform? So I'll start with uh, Irfan first and then move backwards like that, but very quickly, please, with your responses. <laughs> So Irfan, if you if I want to make it clearer, how can we use the SAC platform for collaboration around any sort of tensions or opportunities that come from the UAE Israel deal? No, uh, I I think uh, from the SAC SAC perspective, I don't think uh, it can open the doors as such because still there is a dilemma between India and Pakistan over this uh, particular. Uh, issues in the recent development. So I don't think a SARC is actually a useful tool to uh, for an outreach to the West Asia. That would be my answer. Thank you. Very, I think I would agree with that. Harish uh, Nalavadi. Yes, ma'am. Uh, From the side uh, of I, uh, Yes. Uh, so as far as I understand, uh, it is, of course, uh, quite difficult for SARC to reinvigorate in all these things. At the same time, it doesn't harm if you keep on cooperating, if you keep on building those confidence that is necessary and uh, such other things. Uh, because uh, we cannot afford to uh, jeopardize your, I mean, our peace and security in this nation, especially because we have a collective aim uh, and that aim is to be prosperous and peaceful and secure uh, uh, region as well. Thank you for that. Uh, Aditya? on uh, health. Uh, yes, ma'am. As, as I earlier emphasized, um, SARC should play a major role in health security and, and it has been doing so, but unfortunately, none of these have been binding. So most of these have been voluntary meetings and, you know, uh, voluntary uh, recommendations. But I think SARC should come up together um, to make something binding and something work together, especially in the SARC development goals, so that at least mandating the SARC social charter so that they have an idea of um, where they're going and they can overcome, as I said, they can uh, enhance non-traditional security to overcome their physical security and other aspects. So I think um, I'll, I'll leave by that. SARC should play a major role in enhancing that non-traditional security. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shweta? We'll move over to Sayak in the meantime, as Shweta is undoing her mic. Okay, uh, so my question is Smart City and Sark, right? Oh, okay, cool. So, yeah, Sark, I, I firmly believe Sark can play a really brilliant role, the same way that Euro European Union is playing a role, how the non-UK countries in the in the Europe so much united and find a way how to make a smart city we need to follow that approach and just as small to the Harry's question we neither need uh, Jacobs we neither need Lake Orbiser we need Ananya Roy, Gautam Bhan and their uh, slam dog cities and subaltern discourse to understand that thank you um, Shweta, are you able to respond now? Yeah, I was not able to listen to the audio. So, uh, so the question is that can India practice health diplomacy successfully without tackling the COVID nine uh, without tackling the COVID nineteen situation in India? No, so, we, yeah, we have one common question for everyone, which is that how can I'm the sorry. SARC platform be used, uh, or how can the regional platform regionalism be used for the topic that you raised, which is health? Um, can you talk about that? Just very. Uh, I think I think as I, the main point uh, of my presentation was cooperation. So SARC can be. There are many differences that have caused a setback to uh, the very existence of SARC many a times, and many a times we don't find that much teeth uh, in the SARC as uh, to be a prominent uh, regional organization, but. Uh, if we focus on what the region has, and if we, if uh, keeping the uh, uh, the uh, core uh, problematic issues aside, and using uh, SARC as a platform to promote uh, uh, some uh, uh, like health is a major issue, and SARC can be a platform where uh, uh, traditional health practices and uh, it can be used for that promotion. So I think SAC has a major role to play. 
Okay, thank you. Sunil Kumar, uh, on the economics, where is the where is the uh, potential for cooperation? What can be done at the regional level? Okay, I'm going to move on to Akib and Mush, uh, Mustaq and Nazir. Uh, the Jammu Kashmir issue, is there something that can be raised at the regional mm -hmm. level? Uh, yeah, ma'am. Uh, actually, wanted to say that that uh, through SARC we can uh, at least ensure that the lockdown is uh, lifted, um, so that the democratic processes are ensured. And because it is by this uh, process that uh, that uh, we ensure uh, democratization and the peace will ultimately prevail. Because uh, illiberalism will uh, will back off. And the next thing that I want to say is that uh, it is the uh, platform where uh, where we can at least ensure that we use it to talk about the bilateral issues, but now we can say that, that it has become a trilateral issue. At least we can engage China, Pakistan, and the stakeholders of uh, Kashmir so that the ultimate peace in South Asia is uh, reverted back. Oh, Thank you. And I'm going to slightly change your question, which is that what, what action can be taken at the regional level? No more talks. Uh, okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so keeping the bilateral relations aside, I think uh, Sa I'm really, very really optimistic about the role that SARC can play in uh, ameliorating the effects of these COVID-19 virus. So the, the main reason is because these countries share so much of commonalities in a, sim in a, in a, sim in a sim similar bag, like the impact on their GDP, the impact on remittance, the people below poverty line, and the way they are being impacted. So I think the cooperation would be the best thing possible. And it was once also initiated by the Prime Minister Narendra Modi during the initial phase of the COVID-19 when he uh, called all the heads of the states of these SARC nations. But then it then blurred out. Uh, there may, might be main reasons, but I'm uh, really optimistic on the role that SARC can play in this situation. Thank you so much. Thank you for all your presentations. And thank you for NICE for organizing this. And let's hope we can do more at the regional level. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you nice. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Shruti. Distinguished chair, yes. speakers, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the seventh session. It is my honor to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of NICE to all who have graced us with their presence and contributed their parts to make this event a resounding one. First of all, we would like to express a profuse gratitude and sincere thanks to Neha Bansal for agreeing to chair and moderate this session today. Our sincere thanks also goes to all our speakers for being a part of this event and delivering such a comprehensive and convincing presentation. We are really honored to have all the speakers with us today. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from Diplomatic Community Experts Academia media and different organizations too. Finally, I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for our audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live on our YouTube channel. Thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making this session so productive with your questions. We're truly honored to have you all this afternoon with us and hope we stay connected with you in future as well. It's, a really, it's been really a pleasure to have you on board with us. Please join us for the next session too. Thank you so much.